Alex was dealt this hand um, of, hey, welcome to HEC. We're going to add sediment to RAS. By the way, we've decided to do something totally unique um, and follow this uh, Italian model um, with something we call subgrid bathymetry. And uh, no one's ever really added subgrid bathymetry to a production level sediment model. Um, go. And so everything that Alex ended up doing here, this is just innovative. This is just um, stuff that, that he did. At, at some point, we'll get this in the journals once we kind of get our head above water to breathe. Um, but uh, so this is kind of the, this is the special part. But also just understanding, especially if you're coming from SRH2D or ADH, it's the subgrid um, approach of RAS that's gonna make RAS behave differently. Sometimes you see things in RAS and you're like, that looks weird. Um, it, it's, it's a feature, it, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Um, because the subgrid world thinks about the world differently and there's some huge advantages to that. There's also some downsides. Um, so Alex is gonna start out helping you think about the subgrid world and then talk about you know, the stuff that he did to get sediment into the subgrid world. So what is subgrid modeling? It's the representation of the physical terrain and the processes at a subgrid scale. And by subgrid, I mean subface and subcell scale. So we're capturing the subgrid uh, variation in the terrain, uh, the, how it affects the hydraulic properties. And then we're also capturing the hydrodynamics in the subgrid sense to a certain extent, and depending on what options you choose in the model. We are um, also capturing the subgrid variation of the bed properties, the you know the the sediment properties, uh, the bulk properties like uh, the the bed gradations, the bed layering, all of that. Um, the advantage of the subgrid modeling is that it allows you to use larger computational cells, um, and it reduces uh, run times. Um, so that's the main advantage. Um, as you know, uh, if, if you guys are familiar with like, how the hydraulics are done, every cell is pre-processed and hydraulic property tables are computed at the cells and uh, the faces based on the, the detailed terrain underneath. Each cell can be partially wet and dry and um, it allows for larger, times, larger cells. Larger cells means bigger time steps, less cells, and that makes the model a lot faster. Sediment is a little bit different from hydraulics. It needs to have memory of things on the bed, right? In hydraulics, if there was water at one time step and then there was no water, it doesn't really matter. But sediment, if you deposited sand, you need to remember that you deposited sand. So the subgrade approach is a little bit different in sediment versus hydraulics, and it's more memory and computationally intensive because of this property that we want to remember at a subgrid level where things were deposited in different parts of your uh, elevations of your terrain. So in hydrodynamics, we already covered this. We have two options, diffusion wave shallow water equations. We use subgrid. These are the boundary condition types. And this is an, just a, a quick example that you've prob probably already seen of you know, how subgrid works in hydraulics and why it's so beneficial. This is a computational model with a very small channel compared to the, the grid resolution, right? And if you take this cell, and then zoom in, you can see how the terrain vary, varies within the cell. And then from that terrain, it, at the cell, it computes a, a volume elevation curve and also a volume area curve, or horizontal area curve. Um, and it uses those during the computation, right? It, it knows that at this elevation, it has this amount of volume within the cell. Um, and similarly, at the faces, it it extracts the, the cross-section or profile of the terrain and it computes other hydraulic property tables. Like this is vertical area versus elevation and this is wetted perimeter. And from those you can back out what hydraulic radius is and then you can compute conveyance and a whole bunch of other variables, right? Okay, yeah, you can see that the water's coming through the channel and flowing, not flowing through that channel and then in some places it kind of overflows and floods the areas, but you get a much more realistic uh, simulation with that coarse resolution for this terrain. Um, it's kind of amazing, actually, to see that. If you model this with, you know, a model that doesn't have subgrid, 
you would have maybe two orders of magnitude more cells and it'd be so much slower, right? And maybe you don't really care about this channel. It's just like a secondary channel. It's just a way of getting water out there, right? So that's the real benefit of subgrid. And in hydrodynamics, as I mentioned, the way it's done in hydrodynamics is really great because you just go back to those property tables and interpolate from them during the simulation. And because it doesn't need a memory of what happened before, what parts of the cell were wet or dry, it's very efficient. Sediment is a little bit different, right? I mentioned this is how you go from a cell to this Minecraft world view of the world, <laughs> right? And then from that table, you go to this uh, piecewise linear uh, uh, volume elevation curve. For sediment, um, we need to have a memory of where you deposited stuff within the cell. And so we discretize the area elevation curve into bins. Now, we can't afford to use as many bins as the flow model because the flow hydraulic curves can have 30, 40, 50, 60, even more bins, right? And that's great for hydraulics because it doesn't add computational time to have more points on the curve. So we make them as, as like high resolution as, as possible, really, as we need to. Um, the only drawback is memory requirements. Um, but for sediment, we can't afford that. So we have to, you know, have a compromise, right? You have to, in, in, the, in the interface, you specify the maximum number of subgrid regions. And that's what it uses. It, it basically, in this case, it's three. And you take your original number of bins and you, you merge bins until you have three. And then uh, during the simulation, let's say you have a water level right here. You go from that curve to this curve and you compute your erosion to position rates. You change your elevations. And then from these tables, you go back to the hydraulics and then you kind of loop around that way. And so in this example, um, you can see that this sediment sub area was it was actually partially wet and dry, right? Because the elevation is here, like the area goes along here. So it knows that it should only modify the bed elevation in this, in this bin and not the one next to it. And that's taken care of. So sediment, th that's not the case in flow. In, in flow, every bin is either wet or dry, but in sediment, you can have bins that are, or sub areas that are partially wet and dry and it takes care of all that. And because of all that, like the, the math and the, um, the computations are a little like overly complicated, you know, it, um, it's not free, um, definitely. Subgrid adds like a whole order of magnitude complexity to the model compared to just non-subgrid models. Because now we have to deal with all these subgrid calculations and like spatially average variables and things like that. It has the flexibility to do both because if you were to say, I just want one subregion for my whole cell, then it reduces to the 1D approach. If, you, if, you, if you're, your cell is partially dry or partially wet, then you're changing the bed gradations everywhere in the cell, right? But if you have a lot of subgrid resolution, you can capture that process. Um, right now, you kind of have to predetermine how much subgrid resolution you want in your model. There is one parameter that's a, like a length scale. Um, and basically that says, I want a subgrid resolution of 30 feet. And what that means is that as your cells get bigger and bigger, you want more subgrid resolution. But as your cells get smaller, you reduce the subgrid resolution. So that in, in your project area, maybe where you have a lot of fine cells, you don't need as many subgrid calculations, right? Because you're capturing that already within the cells, that variation. And that's what that parameter is, and it's very useful. Start off as simple as possible, make your model as, as robust as possible, and that's the most fastest and ro most robust approach. If you, once you get your model going and you d d decide that you need the subgrid, then you can add that, you know. There's a limit to this, right? We know that there's a certain amount of terrain at, at a certain amount of elevation, but we don't know where it is within the cell. So we can't do like more sub-cell morphology, right? And then the coupling of of, of this with hydrodynamics, sediment is really influenced by velocities and the velocities are limited by the re resolution of your grid. So if you don't reduce that, you're not gonna capture a lot of those processes. If you select constant, you get a single erosion potential and this is kind of how it's doing it, right? It's one, it uses like an average gradation for the wet part of the cell 
and average hydraulic variables and critical shear stress and all that. And then you have two contributions, right? You have a wet part and a dry part. The dry part I mentioned yesterday that immediately goes to the wet part. And then if you select variable bed, this is the approach where you're, you're taking into account the variable bed composition, but the hydro hydrodynamics is still kind of cell averaged. And this approach is where you try to compute subgrid velocity. So every, I, I can compute what an approximate velocity should be for this based on, you know, contains principles, which is in some cases good, in some cases not so great. Like if you have a bump in your flow, right? The folks actually can accelerate and not, and um, deaccelerate or not, it's gonna accelerate and not be slower. Um, so it's, it's approximate hydrodynamics at the, at the subgrid level, but we try to, I try to do that, you know, each, each one of these gets its own depth and own shear velocity and all of that. Um, so it is more computationally expensive. Um, and then every, every, every one of these also uses the bed gradations from, from that sub area. Uh, the position similar deal where you have, you know, the veneer method and then capacity weighted method. So Volpe is a student of, of Pasuli. She used a capacity-weighted method for deposition in her model uh, for suspended loads, right? Because she didn't need that for bed load. And I followed a similar approach. It's a little bit different, but um, I have, those are the two approaches. The depth-weighted one, I think I'm just going to remove for 6.2 because, again, there's, it's hard to, like, calibrate. And we haven't exposed the, the empirical coefficients, so, like, for the user, it's not even possible. So this was a flood damage reduction project that uh, Fargo, this is the Fargo Diversion Study. Basically, this is one of the biggest projects in the core. They're looking to build this diversion around. But if you look at this little suburb up here, there's essentially a five to one scale model of it that has eroded and deposited. So when Alex set out to do this in 1D, he, you know, how do you calibrate something that's unprecedented? Well, you could actually calibrate to this one to five scale model. And so that's, that's what we're looking at here is Alex's model of this, this, of this actual one that did erode in the channel and deposit in the openings. So they, they had developed the 1D model. And then I thought, well, it'd be really cool to do this in 2D, but with just one cell across the channel and see if we can reproduce the same behavior, you know, to kind of demonstrate the subgrid capability and, and sediment. Because, because the thing that's special about this is that it erodes in the channel and it deposits it in the overbanks, and because it's such a regular geometry, it does so regularly. And um, Alex and I have a paper about how 1D actually does this. Um, it doesn't seem like 1D should do this, the way we have it set up, but because of the way this is driven by the load curve, 1D will actually capture this. Um, but the question is, a 2D model shouldn't capture this, except that it's also a 2D model with, one, with 1D attached to it. So that's, that's why it seems like such a good test case. That's just an example of one of the cross-sections. Okay, so the diversion channel is 6.8 miles. Um, I mentioned there's a 1D uh, existing model. I set up the 2D model with just one cell across, so it's a very small mesh. Um, and it's fine silts and clays. This shows the area elevation curves for hydraulics, which are in red, and sediment is on top. Those are the blue ones. And this horizontal line is the uh, water level. And so as it animates on the next slide, you'll see it go up and down. And this is for a face. You have just kind of the profile of the terrain. The, the, the sediment model actually doesn't know what the profile is. It, it just has like property tables. And I have to, you know, compute this or, you know, what is it, like back calculate um, these elevations from the property tables. Um, and then this slide shows, this uh, figure shows the, the bed change um, for the, the, the different areas that, that are shown here. And this is similar, but for the profile at, at the face, right? So you see there's erosion at, at the, the channel and the, the deeper part of the of the, ch the the low flow channel and then this part there's erosion and then there's deposition in the banks right and the next slide this is going to animate kind of those same figures and this is a, a cross section average velocity for that cross section for that face um, I believe I ran 
10 years, something like that? Uh, 5,000 days. 5,000 days? Um, And so you see that it's only modifying the pieces of the terrain that are below the water surface. And it does capture that general behavior of eroding in the center of the channel and depositing in the banks. It's not perfect. My, my hydraulic calibration for this was actually not great. That's why I haven't published this. Because we don't yet have subgrid uh, Manning's N. Like, I could only get one Manning's N value for the face. And whereas in, in 1D, you can vary the Manning's N, and it does actually vary quite a bit for this data set, um, and you get a much better result. But we're changing that. That's actually the main feature that's going to come out in 6.2, that you'll now have, now have uh, spatially variable Manning's N along faces for 2D. And so as, as you change your, as you'll have a Manning's N versus elevation curve for 2D at faces. And I'm sure I'll, I'll get much better results for this. I'm, that's the feature I'm, I'm really excited about for, for uh, 6.2.